Okay, let's get started. That was a, a delayed start, but that's all right. So today we're gonna kind of do uh, a similar version to what we did on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we were in the Triassic and spending all of our time in the ocean talking about, and freshwater systems a little bit too, but talking about aquatic and marine organisms, mostly fishes, but also some of those tetrapods that have returned to the water. Uh, today, one of my goals is to talk you guys through a whole bunch of these really amazing tetrapods up on land in the Triassic on our journey towards like the crocodiles and the dinosaurs that really make the Mesozoic as a whole so incredible. And so there's an animal that um, I hope you're enjoying looking at. I'm sorry we won't spend too much time on it right now because we're way behind. Um, but that's an animal called a tanistrophid. It's a terrestrial animal. Um, it has relatives that swim a lot, but they're certainly capable of being on land. That thing is not a dinosaur. It is not a particularly close relative of dinosaurs. It's another kind of reptile, and I hope it's upsetting to you. I want you to know that there's many, many, many specimens of these animals, and that is what they look like. So when I saw that Onion article talking about how the Triassic is this amazing time of experimental evolution, it's really sort of shocking the kinds of body plans uh, and things that show up in the Triassic. This is what we're talking about. I hope you can see up in those trees some really early pterodactyls, little guys. Uh, the first time vertebrates ever evolved powered flight is in the Triassic, and it's those things. And so those animals are all part of the same bigger group of reptiles. And so this is like nothing on there is a dinosaur. And that's what's great about the Triassic. So let's get into it. So you guys have seen this now a few times, our Triassic sort of summary slide. I won't belabor it given that we're behind, but today we're gonna to be talking about what's going on on land. So the story of the Triassic, besides being sort of funny in the sense that so many crazy things evolve, is that it's also the time when in terms of the higher level clades, almost everything shows up. So today, hopefully we'll walk through some of the origins and earliest members of a lot of the amphibian lineages, frogs, salamanders, sicilians, some of the reptile lineages like turtles. We're gonna talk about squamates, that's things like lizards and snakes. The tuatara, if you don't know what the tuatara is, it's this lone little animal today. There's one species left that lives on New Zealand, but it's part of a radiation that began in the Triassic. And of course, mammals. We'll save the crocodiles and birds, birds equals dinosaurs in this case, uh, for next week. Um, and so those are kind of the two big things happening on land that I want you guys to really take away. The Triassic is a time of major clade origins for modern biodiversity, and then things that are related to them or doing their own thing being very, very, very impressive and wild in terms of like all the different body plants that evolve. So let's get into this. You saw this on a uh, um, lecture on Tuesday, and I'm just going to click through it, right? Giving you context for all that vertebrate evolution that we've been talking about. Back in the Devonian, I was able to put all of the vertebrates on the one slide. You guys can see tetrapods and lungfishes and sharks. I can't do that anymore. So there's the fishes, wave to them. I know it's too many fishes for you guys. I get that, but I just have to show them to you. So let's go up onto land now. Same as before, there's that Paleozoic era where so much of the radiations of the bigger, bigger picture of vertebrate biodiversity happened in the Devonian, the Silurian, the Carboniferous, the Permian. Then there's the big mass extinction event. We're gonna use this slide today to kind of work our way clockwise, starting over with amphibians, and talk about a lot of the clades that have evolved in the Triassic. And you can see, we can just talk about what happened with mammals in the Triassic. But when it comes to reptiles, it's a little bit messier. So let's go forward. That's what's gonna happen in the Triassic period though. Most of those remaining splits, except for that one, which is snakes, happen in the Triassic. If it didn't happen in the Paleozoic, happened in the Triassic. All right, so let's talk about those list amphibians, the frogs and salamanders, and today, Sicilians. And so there's a big group of uh, amphibians from the Carboniferous, those big stereospondyls, the scary big ones, that absolutely live all through the Triassic and keep going right alongside this clade, which is your living amphibians you guys are more familiar with. And so not only do we have the first frogs, which appear immediately almost in the Triassic, and actually the earliest frog is the same called Tridopatrachus. I'll show it to you. It's from Madagascar, which is a pretty cool place to be from. Uh, but back then, Madagascar is just part of the southern part of Pangaea. It's not an island or anything. And so we're going to talk about that. And this is almost all in freshwater um, for these animals. You guys have already met now twice from me, the only saltwater, we think, amphibians, one of these stereospongal groups, those traumatosaurs that in the early part of the Triassic live in the oceans. But I'll jump forward now. There's those big stereospondyls. So here's those stereospondyls in the Triassic. There's so, 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 so many of them. They do a lot of really interesting things. I sort of love them very much. 
Uh, go ahead and talk to your for a second. Uh, what do you think the deal is with these hysteria spondles? All right, what what are we what are what what are our just like gut instincts when we see these big stereospondyls? What's their deal probably? Henry says don't go into the river is his deal. Anybody else have any thoughts? So something that I think is really incredible is in the Triassic, animals that are taking reptiles, I should say, that are taking that niche that modern day crocodiles are in, kind of scary, sit and wait at the water's edge predator. Those evolved in the middle and later part of the Triassic. These animals existed in the, in the Permian. They exist all through the Triassic. But in that early part of the Triassic, these are those dominant freshwater predators. And so these are big amphibians. You, I mean, at a glance, they are just basically gigantic murderous salamanders. Some of them are like very big, 15, 18 feet long maybe, like crocodiles. And so what I like about this is amongst vertebrates, once we get to this time in Earth history, somebody's always being a crocodile, even if it's not real crocodiles yet, which I think is cool. Uh, they have big, 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 sharp teeth. Not only do they have the marginal dentition and their premax and maxilla and their denaries, but they also have teeth on the roof of their mouths. They're famous for these big, big kind of things that are called tusks or boomerang fangs, big teeth in the middle of their mouth. So when they clamp their jaws shut, there's like inside teeth. This one, Mastodonsaurus, is relatively famous. Here's these big tusks. They're not true tusks as in like ever growing, but that's what they're called. When this animal shuts its mouth, those are holes in its skull and those teeth poke out which is really wild to imagine. There's probably soft tissue, of course, on the lower jaw, like a kind of gum, but those teeth are still somehow fully sticking out when the mouth is closed, which is just like a very wild thing um, to have, and I couldn't tell you why. I think these animals are really incredible, really cool predators. They have like a very intense indignity uh, in popular culture, because some people call them the toilet seat animals because of their mouth and head, <laughs> which I can't really refute, yeah. but that's kind of a bummer. Uh, for a clade of animals that was very successful for tens of millions of years, and then we're like, you know what that looks like. <laughs> the toilet. But I think these are great animals. So I know you guys, we've talked about this a few times at this point, but um, I do almost all of my research, but not all, almost all my research in the Permian and the Triassic. And so these are animals like those dicynodont therapsids with the tusks uh, that you met before that I have to find and deal with all the time, even if I'm looking for early dinosaurs or other things. And so this is a picture of me uh, and another student uh, when I was a graduate student. And so that's us in Antarctica. We're in the Transantarctic Mountains, getting close to the South Pole. That ice that you're seeing going off into the distance, that's towards the South Pole. And on one of these mountainsides, we're excavating this big rock right there that looks like a triangle. That's the skull of one of these really big temnospondyl amphibians. And this is one of the first animals I ever got to dig up, which was really cool. Um, and so I have a very soft spot for these guys. That's me and the other grad student pretending to show you how big the animal was. The triangle is its head, and there's its arms and legs and tail made up of our bodies. Yeah, and that takes a super long time, especially in Antarctica, because they have to like take us there in a helicopter and drop us off with just like a couple of tools. You can see behind me is like a saw that has like a diamond tip so we can cut into the rock and like try our best, but mostly it's just us going like ding, 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 ding. It took a few days, which is great though down there because the sun doesn't set the whole time. So you can just do it for as long as you feel like and then go to bed. It's never like the day is over. And so we had to like work to get that skull out. And what I like about this isn't just like, oh cool fossils in Antarctica, but it's fun for you guys to imagine like a forested warm ecosystem with a giant amphibian. And of course today it's like <laughs> Antarctica. 
So the world changes and these continents move around and the climate is different back in the Mesozoic. And so I just think um, there's nothing cooler than like actually pulling out an amphibian from the rock of a place where when we were at this camp, we got dropped off by the helicopter, me and that student and this other professor, who's a guy from South Africa, we were the only macroscopic organisms for like 18 miles in any direction. There's no plants, there's no lichens, there's no birds flying overhead. You're in the middle of Antarctica. And so there's fossil forests, there's trees, there's fossil leaves, there's early cynodonts, there's some archosaurs, and there's these amphibians just like in the ground. But otherwise you're like, nothing much happening up here. And that's cool. Uh, we don't have to talk about this. That's another temnospondyl uh, from Africa. So this is the back of the skull. You're seeing the holes where the jaw muscle fits in. You can complete the triangle if you go forward. These animals I have a soft spot for. I've never spent too much time doing direct research on them, but they are pretty cool. So aside from those stereospondyls, the other thing that's happening in the Triassic, like I said, is the origin of major clays. And so all three groups of list amphibians, we have either direct fossils of them, or in the case of salamanders, their presence is inferred, and we have fossils of them, in this case, from the very early, early, early parts of the next period, the true salamanders. But Tritobotrachus is the oldest frog and the oldest known list amphibian, which is pretty fun to imagine. Of the three major groups, the one that has a fossil record that goes back the farthest is frogs. And frogs are pretty derived and interesting animals. We'll talk about them in lab in two weeks. Hopping guys. So Tritopatricus from Madagascar, Cacartus from Kyrgyzstan, and then this animal, which was only described last year, and it's a fantastic animal, Funcus vermis, which means the funky worm. Um, this animal was a huge deal when it was found. This was found in Petrified Forest National Park. So if you guys have ever been down to Arizona, go to the Grand Canyon, go to the Meteor Crater, go to Flagstaff or Sedona, and then go to Petrified Forest. Uh, it's a really, really, really incredible place with Triassic rocks. It's a petrified forest because there's a Triassic forest preserved all over the park. And these people down at that park were sifting through bags and bags and bags and bags of dirt with microscopes. And they have found many thousands of beautiful, tiny fossils. And so they've been filling in a lot of biodiversity. And so Funcus vermis is the oldest known Sicilian. Today, Sicilians have no arms and no legs. Uh, there's a few Sicilians known from the Jurassic that still have arms and legs. And so Funcus vermis is reconstructed with arms and legs. They have a couple teeny pieces of limb, I think, uh, but mostly they have skull bones. You can see the lower jaw there. And I just want you guys to understand that like, not only is this really fun, but new discoveries are happening all the time. Funcus vermis not only is a great name, but it's really big scientific news. When they announced at the paleontology conference that they had a Sicilian from Arizona, it was like the only thing people talked about in the Triassic day of the conference. And when this animal finally got published, it was the cover of nature because that's what fossils can do, right? Is like show you what the earliest members of different radiations look like. Sicilians have a terrible fossil record, but we know if we have Triassic and early Jurassic frogs and salamanders, we should have Sicilians. Where are they? Where are they? Well, these people looked hard enough in the right kind of environment, the right kind of aged rocks, and they found it. That's really, really great. And so it's not often that a Sicilian gets the cover of nature, let alone a teeny little fossil one. So that's pretty cool. There's a really fun herbivorous croc relative in the background that we'll talk about another day. Okay, so there's our amphibians. What's going on in the Jurassic? The frogs and salamanders and the Sicilian there. Now we're gonna jump over, talk about mammal stuff. So you guys have already seen this slide. We talked about the different therapsid groups. The therapsids are a middle Permian radiation of synapsids. You are a therapsid. Therapsida is monophyletic. You guys probably remember the one clade of the anomodonts called the dicynodonts. They survived the end Permian mass extinction, all those interesting ways of surviving it, making burrows, changing your life history. And then all throughout the Triassic, there were all kinds of really fun anomodonts, those big guys with beaks, really wild animals. They're part of that weird Triassic fauna. The other clade there, Sibelians, they did survive too, but only for a short time. They evolved herbivory, that's nice. But now let's talk about our clade, the cynodonts. You guys are cynodonts, whales and elephants are cynodonts, platypuses are cynodonts, it's a weird thing to say, but cynodontia is a monophyletic clade and there's several members in the Triassic, diversity in the Triassic that we'll talk about today. So you can see there's two clades that evolve and go extinct within the context of the Triassic and one clade called mammaliomorphs, which I'm sure you can deduce is where mammals goes, uh, that we are a part of. So there's a couple of different strains I'll talk about here, basically this left-hand side and this right-hand side for what happens with our evolution, synapsid or therapsid or cynodont or mammal, whatever you wanna call it, evolution in the Triassic. And so here are uh, that first clade, that left-hand clade, the Um, I'll let you uh, 
take these in for a quick second while I'll take, catch my breath. You can see a dysinodont having a bad day. There's no more pariasaurs. So it's usually dysinodonts now they are upside down with their ribs exposed um, once you get to the Triassic. So what's really fun about this clade to me is you guys saw so many different evolutions in the Permian and in the uh, Triassic a little bit of reptiles, yes, but also synapsid lines where the baseline model of all these clades is like a relatively small bodied, like carnivorous little animal. Some of them get big and become big predators and every lineage almost seems like somebody evolves herbivory. And so this clade of cyanodonts is called cyanognathians. The earliest diverging member, the one that's sister to all the rest of the clade is this animal that's the namesake called cyanognathus. It's a really big, uh, you know, like lionish sized predator from the middle Triassic. It has these big, scary mammal looking teeth. Obviously, it's not quite mammally. You probably don't like that it doesn't have ears sticking out or anything like that, but it's a predator. There's a couple other species that have now been found that are in that part of the tree. But the next node up in Cyanognathia is this animal called Diademodon. Here's Diademodon's skull. Here's Cyanognathus' skull. I know this picture isn't showing it to you too well, but when you look at the slides, when you uh, check the Moodle page, you'll see that the post canine teeth, the molar area teeth on Diademodon, start to get cusps and they start to become labiolingually expanded. We get sort of an expansion of the teeth and diademon is thought to at least somewhat be eating plant matter or at least chewing up food. Cyanodonathus has sharp cutting teeth all through its mouth. So in this clade of cyanodonts, we have another example of herbivory evolution. And what happens is the animals that survive into the late Triassic and go all the way to the boundary of the Triassic are these animals called gomphodont cyanodonts. And I'll let you guys look at their teeth and look at their heads for a second and uh, talk to each other. What do you notice about these cyanodonts? Yeah. Yeah. Well, why is that? Of course, you look at the arrow of 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 the arrow very strong. Yeah, exactly right. All right, what kind of things people are talking about? I have sauce box examples. I think they're really fun. <laughs> Looks like they're a lot of chewing. A lot of chewing. So these three skulls, Pascal Ignatius, Messina Ignatius, Exoridodon, these skulls are all in dorsal view. You're looking at them top down. Here's the eyeballs. And then there's huge amounts of space for jaw musculature. Exoridodon is the latest of them in terms of time. And you can see like there's even like extensions of the skulls for jaw muscles to attach even farther on. They have very powerful bites and a lot of different muscles in there that can move their jaws around. I know you probably can't see it quite. But these images right here are, that's Pacetognathus, this is Exoridonon, these are their teeth that are very closely packed and again, labiolingually expanded with these big cusps on them. So that's Exoridonon right there, skull in ventral view, so you're seeing it pallid. You can see those giant molar-like teeth, still has the big canines that are kind of sharp, which is pretty fun. But these are animals that are almost certainly processing plant matter, which is really fun. An evolution of herbivory amongst the cyanodonts. And so these things are called these gonfodont cyanodonts because of those wide uh, teeth that are behind their canine, their post-canine teeth. Um, they're really interesting. They're sort of in that uncanny valley where they kind of look like mammals, but they also are kind of not mammally. A lot of these cyanodonts are pretty bizarre. Um, but I think this is fun. These are an important part of the herbivorous ecosystems 
that dinosaurs first evolve in. So just like some of those dicynodonts are living alongside dinosaurs, as some of the first dinosaurs become herbivores, one of the big groups in that herbivore niche space when dinosaurs start playing with it are these cynodonts. So there's two therapsid groups eating plants and like you could think of it as like the middle Triassic of South America and the first dinosaurs are little predators. When some of them start to eat plants, they're replacing animals like that cynodont. They're replacing animals like these gonfodont cynodonts. Which is really cool. This is usually a part of time in Earth history that's kind of forgotten. People talk about the Permian, they talk about the extinction, and then dinosaurs show up, and then it's dinosaur time in everybody's brains. And there's this fun window in the early, middle, and beginning of the late Triassic when there's a bunch of therapsids like still doing cool stuff. Okay. The other side of the cynonot tree, so we just talked about these cynognathians that evolve herbivory, is this side over here. This is the side that we're on. Um, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of science on this part of the tree. You can imagine humans care quite a bit about the origin of mammals and like true little mammal guys. So there's a ton of things we could talk about. I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. So here's a skull of an animal uh, called Aliodon that people, uh, my collaborators that we have found in Tanzania. Aliodon is an early member of this clade of cynodonts called probanignathians. You are probanignathian. Mammals are probanignathian. They're mostly little carnivores, keeping up with that trend of uh, what therapsids are up to. You can see they get sort of smaller. Um, that one, Chiniquidon, there is like probably like beagle sized. Um, what I want you guys to look at though is the skull. So there's Probanignathus. The blue is the denary, the green is the squamosal, and then orange and red are quadrate and articular. And so here's an animal that has this mammalian dentition, it's got these mammalian features starting to show up, but the jaw joint of its skull is still the jaw and the skull touch, the quadrant and the articular are the only two bones that make contact. So talk to you for a quick second. How does that denary compare to some of the denaries you saw in like other therapsids? I think yeah. the single select all these girls. It was like you could almost just punch it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, there's a lot more now. I just want to still have the best. So I'm hearing people saying that the denary is huge, right? The denary is almost, but not quite, the only bone in the lower jaw. There's still a little bit back here. And then that quadrant and that articular that make that jaw joint. You guys have a quadrant articular. It's the first and second bones in your middle ear. But in this animal, those are still the jaw joint. Um, and the denary is most of the lower jaw. So these are animals from probably parts of like the middle Triassic, like right where about where it says 240 there on the timeline. And as we move through the Triassic, a lot of things happen. So here's another little one uh, from South America called Brazilodon. Um, they're getting teenier and tinier. Sometimes these skulls are only about this big. Mammals are small, or I should say mammals, pervading Nathian cynodonts are small. Um, we don't know in this case when their body size gets small, this is when hair kind of shows up. It's very controversial to figure out exactly when people start to get people, when cynodonts start to get fluffy, when they start to get their hair. Uh, there's many, many, many cynodonts from the late Triassic. Most of them, like I said, are small bodied. Some of them are little burrowers. Some of them seem like they can probably climb. So there's interesting ecologies happening. This animal, though, Brasilodon, still does have that articulation between the quadrate and the articular for the lower jaw, but you can almost not even see them because all of this is the denary. And then as we get towards the very end of the Triassic, we have animals like this one, which is called Morganucodon. Morganucodon is so tiny. Morganucodon's skull is like this big, like an inch long. And Morganucodon is one of the absolute first animals we have that has a denary squamosal jaw joint. So the green bone and the blue bone are the things that make up the jaw joint. That is exactly what's happening in all of your heads right now. And so it's in the late Triassic that these uh, anatomical transformations are complete. Morganucanon has a little teeny little set of ear bones back there. They're just off the joint. But what's really interesting to me is we can look at all these other features of their bodies. We can do histology, cut up their bones, look at how they grew. Morganucanon is tiny. It's almost certainly furry. It has a denary that takes up the whole lower jaw. It's got three bones in its little middle ear, but it still grows like very reptile way. Even though it's an animal that has a body length like this, something you guys would think of as like a mouse or a hamster, there's still individuals of Morganucanon that are like 11 or 12 years old because they grow slowly. Modern mammals go, whoop, they 
grow up in six weeks or eight weeks to get to this big. So these animals are growing still in a way that's not very mammalian, but so much of their skeleton is getting really mammalian. So we're in this very odd place where you're like, that's pretty much a mammal. And it is in most ways. I think that's pretty cool. Any questions about cyanide stuff? By the time we get to the end of the Triassic, you know, the end of the Permian, you had all these therapsids, those giant organs, these giant dicynodons. By the time we get to the end of the Triassic, almost all the synapses that are left, you could like hold in your little hands like this, which is very interesting. It's important. We'll talk about it. So let's talk about modern mammals, though. You guys have seen this many times by now. Um, Characters that unite the Spinacodontians, which you guys are a part of. Characters that unite the Therapsids, which you guys are a part of. Characters that unite the Cyanots, which you guys are a part of. You've seen all that already. But when we talk about the modern mammal groups, today's modern mammals are monotremes, placental mammals, and marsupials. We, of course, are placentals. That radiation between those three happens in the next period, which we haven't got to yet, the Jurassic period. And so things like Morganucodon have a lot of those characters that I'm about to show you, but not quite all of them as far as we can tell. So let's talk about the four snake morphies I want to give you guys for crown mammalia, the living mammals. And so one of them, Morganucodon, absolutely does have. And so for mammals today that sets us apart from other tetrapods, other amniotes, the denary is the only bone in the lower jaw. And the denary articulates with the squamosal. So that's a big deal in the sense that like mammals don't have like kinesis. They can't flex their jaws like a lot of reptiles can. Your bone of your jaw is very rigid. Um, but it's certainly something that's useful because paleontologists can find it in the rock record easily. You know, we can talk about function another time. So I'll really take a second, look at that lizard skull. Look at the lizard's red dentary and look at the lizard's purple squamosal. Look how those bones are far away from each other in that lizard skull. Look at those bones are touching each other in the mammal skull. That orange bone, the quadrate, that yellow bone, the angular, that purple bone, the articular, those are all ear bones in you. But in a lizard, it's all that architecture. It's a pretty big difference. Of course, the complement to only having a denary making up your lower jaw is that all mammals, of course, only have or do have this unique ear in the middle part of their ear where three bones the malleus and the incus, which are part of, formerly part of your lower jaw, and then the stapes, which is formerly part of the back of your skull, making up this series of bones that all resonate when your eardrum resonates to transfer sound. So three bones in your middle ear is a mammal only thing. And we can see that as we go from animals like Morganucodon, who you guys have now met, and we go up through a bunch of mammals from the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods, there's a platypus, there's an opossum on there, to get to the, the what we see in animals like a platypus, where there's a denary, and a little teeny ear, middle ear floating over here, and then an opossum where there's a denary and a little teeny middle ear floating there. In Morganucanon, the middle ear part isn't quite there. The denary is touching the skull, the denary is touching the squamosal, but these bones aren't in their middle ear configuration yet, so not the mammal condition for the middle ear for Morganucanon. I like this one. <laughs> I think you guys know this one. If you ask a bunch of third graders what makes a mammal a mammal, there's two possible first answers. This is one of them. Um, hair is a really, really interesting derived dermal structure. Um, we could spend a lot of time, we're not going to because it's a soft tissue, talking about hair's evolution and how it might have come about. Ideas, of course, have to do with things like insulation, keeping your body warm. Uh, if you, you can think about it as like keeping your body warm uh, from external temperatures. You can also think about it as like if you're evolving a higher metabolism, a hotter physiology, and you want to retain your own heat. So it doesn't matter what the temperature is outside. You're trying to keep your heat in. That's an interesting idea. Almost all of us, our hairs on our bodies have little muscles attached to them. You guys get goosebumps because you're humans and you don't have very interesting hair anymore on most parts of your body. Uh, so that's because your hair can like raise up because so that means it can be used for things in like display. Certainly it can increase the pockets of air that are trapped under the hair in your skin. So that's also related to thermal regulation. Hair is a really derived structure. Obviously some of these animals are using it for display. That's a maned wolf over there. That's really just a big just tall fox from South America. And then that porcupine obviously is turning its hair into very derived structures like quills, pokey things. Uh, I don't think that baby orangutan is doing anything special. It's just a great picture of hair. Um, and hair is a keratin structure. It's similar, different protein type, but it's a keratin structure just like your fingernails are. And so all amniotes 
claws, nails, hair, feathers, almost all of those are keratin type structures. And so modern biologists can get into the different ways animals genetically and developmentally have figured out how to turn those dermal structures into interesting things. Suffice it to say, probably you don't have to write this down. Mammals have hair, that's a synapomorphy <laughs> of mammals. And then the other one kind of goes with hair. Our skin is quite um, complicated. We have like a soft skin. You don't have scales all over your body like a reptile. You have a skin that is soft um, and it has um, layers in it that are also keratinized. You guys have dead skin that peels off that help keep you uh, water retaining, keep your body relatively wet on the inside. And there's also temperature regulation things that happen there. And so sweat glands are something that only mammals have. If you see a hot day, there is no turtle, there is no bird, there is no frog that is sweating, but mammals sweat. We can excrete liquid intentionally because that liquid can then evaporate off of us and take heat away. So it's probably something that's complementary to our hair. And so you guys have these sweat glands all over your body and your complicated and evolved dermis. Unfortunately, the fossil record does not tell us a lot about how this structure evolved because it doesn't usually preserve. Uh, does anybody know what the most specialist sweat glands are? Yeah. Mammary glands. And so if you ask a bunch of third graders or second graders, what makes a mammal a mammal? They say hair. And then if you say, what else? They say, no. And so whether you like it or not, mammary glands are a whole lot of sweat glands pushed together <laughs> to excrete in one way. So mammals have evolved this ability to take what was a kind of uh, excretion and add nutrients to it intentionally to take care of offspring. And so what you guys probably just don't even think about is like, oh yeah, mammals have milk. Well, what is milk? But this very, very intensely derived sustenance for the offspring that comes from what anatomy we have. And so when you think of mammary glands or when you think of mammals with milk, you might think of our species, or you might think of something like an elephant, which is basically functionally identical to what we have. But there's another kind of mammal today, a platypus. Platypuses and echidnas also have milk, but you probably remember they lay eggs. There's a bunch of weird stuff with them still. It's not quite what we do. Platypuses, a female platypus, does not have a concentrated spot where a bunch of those glands come together, AKA a nipple. Therian mammals, marsupials and placentals, an opossum, a kangaroo, an elephant, a human, you guys have nipples. The platypuses and the echidnas, they have a patch on their stomachs where they sweat out milk and their fur just gets saturated and then the babies just lick it up. So only, you could say mammary glands and we mean the glands in the skin, but when we talk about specialized structures like this, that's only marsupials and placentals. But the sweat glands are the more ancient, obvious feature, and a very, very, very special sweat gland are those mammary glands. And I think that's great. I can't show you a fossil of that, of course, and unfortunately, because these structures are soft and do not preserve as fossils almost ever. But that's definitely something we know unites mammals. And so if you think about things like small body size, you think about things like endothermia, you think about things like regulating your body temperature, if you think about things like investing in your offspring in a pretty serious way, all of those can form a suite of adaptive features that nature selection is gonna act on to make mammals all kind of do certain things that are similar, which is really cool. So keep that in mind when we talk about mammals. I think that's fun and I hope uh, like breasts being concentrated sweat factories is like news to you because I think it's great. Okay. So here's our modern tetrapod biodiversity. I've taken off that Paleozoic and uh, Jurassic structure to it. We've talked about our amphibians in the Triassic. We've talked about those cynodonts getting really close to being mammals in the Triassic. We'll see more mammals in the Jurassic next. But now let's go up into the reptiles. Reptiles are the animals that are going the most buck wild in the Mesozoic. And so the crown group of reptiles, you guys have met parareptiles and ichthyosaurs and all these animals that are over here. They come off like this. So they're reptiles. Reptilia is like that bigger group. Everything to the left on this amniota node is a reptile. And then there's a special name for the common ancestor of all the things that are alive right now. So ichthyosaurs are probably outside of that. Parareptiles are outside of that. But if you take a lizard or a snake, and you take a bird, and they have a common ancestor, that clade is called sauria. That equals crown group reptiles. That's what most of you guys mean when you say reptiles. There's one snapomorphy for the living saurians that I want you guys to have. It's true for some of the fossil ones too, but for, for sake of ease, we're gonna put it at this clade. And that is a diapsid 
skull fenestration. So you'll remember that modern day mammals, you and all the synapses from the Carboniferous and the Permian and the Triassic were synapses. They had one temporal opening that jaw muscles passed through. It's kind of controversial, but that condition, that lateral opening is probably just the ancestral condition for amniotes. That's kind of up in the air right now. It's being worked out. There's a lot of problems. But what we don't have a controversy with is that all the reptiles are diapsids. They have two holes in their skull for jaw muscles to attach onto. And so there they are, an upper and a lower temporal fenestra. So we got Stegosaurus, a crocodile, and an iguana, a lizard, a croc, and a dino. They all have an upper temporal fenestra on each side and then a lower temporal fenestra on each side. That's what we mean when we talk about skull fenestration. The lizard's done something fancy and lost a little bit of bone that used to connect these. We'll talk about that in lab. And so it looks like it's open down here, but it's still ancestrally that one opening on the lower part, one opening from the top part. Okay, so if we go up into the modern day reptiles, take that in for a second. One side has some familiar faces. The other side, I think, also has familiar faces. And it's important to me that you guys break your brain away from like lizards and crocs and turtles and their reptiles, and then there's birds, because that's not how it is. Crocodiles and turtles go with birds. Snakes and lizards are over here. Okay? So that side is anything on that side of the crown group reptiles is called an archosauromorph, archosauromorpha. Inside archosauromorpha, there is a nice monophyletic clade that all the DNA and all the anatomy and all the fossils support really well called archosauria. Birds and crocodiles today, no matter what you look at, when we're talking about evolutionary history, maybe not lifestyle, but evolutionary history, are sister to each other. And that clade is called archosauria. Birds plus crocs is rock solid and turtles are their friends. And on that side, that's archosauromorpha. The other side is called lepidosauromorpha. So you have your split. You guys can think about it as like Actopterygians and Sarcopterygians. And then if you go back from that, Osteichthys and Chondrichthys. Okay, when you're in reptiles, Lepidosauromorphs, Archosauromorphs. And on the Lepidosauromorph side of the tree, you won't be surprised to know that this clade is Lepidosauria. Just like on that side, it's Archosauria. Turtles have always given everybody a headache. We'll worry about that later. <laughs> but that's where turtles go, trust me. Just, just take my word for now. So Lepidosaurs are over here, and that's these living groups the snakes and lizards, and then this weirdo animal some of you probably have heard of called the tuatara. That's the animal that's only one species left living in New Zealand. I have a character that unites Lepidosauria, so the living group of Lepidosaurs. This is a character that we don't have great fossil evidence for, for Lepidosauromorphs. I wish we did, and you'll see why, but I think it's, again, a pretty fun one. All Lepidosaurs, the tuatara and the lizards and snakes, are united by the shared presence of hemipenes. So what a hemipenes is, is that every male snake or lizard or tuatara has a left and a right, we can be technical and say intromittent organ. What we really mean is two penises, a left and a right. And so when these animals mate, they all have great big tails. They come up next to each other and depending on what side the approach is from, the male uses one or the other during mating. So this is of course a feature you're only gonna see in male individuals anyway, but it's something that's pretty interesting. And so there's a big uh, lizard with his hemipenes exposed and there's a snake with its hemipenes exposed. As you might imagine, uh, reproductive organs have an insanely high amount of selective pressure on them. And so if you care to, you could go look up all the snake and lizard hemipenes and you'll see some really amazing colors and shapes, but I won't subject you. Hemipenes unite all lepidosaurs. Okay, let's talk about lepidosauria diversity. We'll first go over here and talk about this animal, the tuatara. Oh, no, no, not yet. I'm gonna break it up. You guys were looking at the living biodiversity, right? So here's all the animals alive right now in your biology textbook. Now we're gonna paleontologize them. Uh, do me a favor, talk about the distribution of these clades in time. Yeah, I'll let you walk around because I've really been yammering. Yeah, 
We did talk about it. So I like to go back and forth between the modern diversity and the fossils so that you guys remember that things like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs do fit in here somewhere on that slide that has a frog and a possum on it, right? They're up there within the reptiles somewhere. And so Sauropterygians, which we met in lab, right? Those really bizarre Triassic diversifications of marine reptiles. Most of them are in this place, Sauropterygians that we'll talk a lot more about later. They're probably, asterisk, I'm gonna put money, but not like all my money, on the fact that they are a kind of Lepidosaur morph. Ichthyosaurs are more mysterious. So I've dotted lines them, and I don't think they're in the crown, but they might be. We'll find out, ongoing research. It's really hard to see early Ichthyosaur specimens. But you can see here, archosauromorphs, crocodiles, turtles, birds, and their relatives, excellent fossil record. If you guys remember, before we talked about synapses at all, we talked about Paleozoic reptiles. The only actual ones we have are two or three archosauromorphs from the very end of the Permian. But when it comes to Lepidosauromorphs, there's a great record that starts here if you're counting all these marine reptiles, which is fine. But if you're talking about the crown group, the Lepidosaurs, this group is the one that has the tuatara, and that group is the one that has all of today's snakes and lizards. You can see for a lot of the Triassic, we don't have very much evidence. We're going to see so many reptiles in the Triassic, and they're almost all archosaurs. So there's only a handful of lepidosaurs. So let's talk about these early lepidosaurs. Increasingly, there's a lot of really good fossils of early lepidosaurs, and what's really challenging is figuring out if they are just early lepidosaurs outside of the modern day biodiversity, if they're early members of the Tuatara lineage, or if maybe, and by golly, do a lot of scientists want to find this, are they early squamates? Today, snakes and lizards are one of the most diverse clades of vertebrates. Everybody wants to find the earliest squamate. There's plenty of papers from the last few years where people say they have the earliest squamate, and then three years later, everyone's like, you don't. Um, but we want to, and it should exist, right? Hypothesis testing is such that we would expect there to be squamates if there are animals like the Tuatara around in the Triassic. So I don't fault them for trying. Uh, it's very frustrating. These animals are almost all tiny. They're almost all, hold them in your hand like a lizard in a pet store, even though they're not hashtag lizards. They are a different kind of thing that boy, oh boy, do look like lizards. Uh, but they're early lepidosaurs. So there's a nice skull of one from the really early Triassic. That's an animal from South Africa right after the big extinction boundary. Things like Lystrosaurus coming out of its burrow, that animal Palaguana is there. And what is Palaguana? It's probably a Lepidosaur, but probably not in the living diversity. And so these animals are small, they're delicate. And so people who did that work in petrified forests to find the Sicilian, that's eventually going to be how we find these early squamates. People are going to have to do microfossil stuff. You can't walk around the badlands, you got to get on your hands and knees and go like this. It's going to take a while, but I'm sure we'll find them. So the two clades of lepidosaurs, one is this big one called Rhynchocephalia. Rhynchocephalia is the big clade name, for the animal today that is only represented by the tuatara. So here's the tuatara. These are photos of a living thing. It only lives on a couple of islands on, off the coast of New Zealand. You can't even find this thing on mainland New Zealand anymore because when people showed up, they brought a bunch of rats and stuff with them. So this thing only lives on islands off the coast of New Zealand. It looks very prehistoric. Everybody loves its big tail and its spikes and stuff like that. It's one species, one species that the living representative of this radiation that definitely starts way back here in the beginning of the Triassic. So throughout the Jura Triassic, throughout the Jurassic, throughout the Cretaceous, there's all kinds of different sizes and shapes of Tuatara relatives. Um, a lot of them look a lot like the Tuatara today, um, sort of a lizardy thing. One thing that makes them sort of unique is they do this they do this thing with their teeth where they fuse their teeth to their jaws. Their teeth erupt, and then they like a bony collar literally fuses them in. So those teeth are like rock solid and they can crunch stuff up, probably bugs. Um, and that is called acrodonty. And that's something that helps us recognize early rhynchocephalians. 
Some of the rink civilians get big, some get small, that's all fine. This one right here, you guys actually have already seen. If you go back and look at our marine reptile slides, our marine reversions slides from lab, in the Jurassic, there is a lineage of these animals that goes into the ocean ecosystems and is a swimming marine reptile. So even to Atara relatives do the marine reptile thing, which is really fun. These are cool. If you want to look them up, look them up. They're called rink. Rink means nose because of that beak. That really it's their premaxilla that's nice and sharp. The living one has that premax too, but you can see in real life when there's soft tissue on there, it doesn't look all that sharp. You'll see one of those in lab. Don't worry, I'll bring it up. These are fun animals. I don't have too much more to say about them, but you need to see them as part of like the earth story, I say. All right, so the other side of rhynchocephalians uh, in Lepidosauria are the squamates. Nope, but we're not gonna talk about the squamates, that's right. <laughs> Because, 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 because squamates have almost no fossil record until the Jurassic. That's right. So I decided to save them. So lizards, true lizards, and snakes we'll get to later. So the other side of saurian diversity in the Triassic is these archosauromorphs. So you guys have already seen this text. Lepidosauromorphs might include those marine sauropterygians. They're small. They're not all that diverse, and there's not that many of them. Archosauromorpha is a joke about how many there are. It's going to be upsetting how many clades I show you and how weird they all are. So these are the croc, turtle, bird relatives in the Triassic. So here's me expanding Archosauromorpha a little bit so that you guys can see some of that diversity. So you can see there is where turtles go, about, maybe, I put a dotted line, and there's crocs and there's birds. Here's some of those clades of early Archosaurs in the Triassic. I'll let you take a few minutes with this. How would you try to even summarize these animals? uh, and uh, the big, another similar test to give not terrible with these plants in China on the next uh, national data versus me. Okay, how do you balance that? I mean, the fact that they require the instructor to support the end of the process, well, no matter how much you're going to place it, very All right, what things are we talking about? These animals are a nightmare, so I just want to, I'll start anyway. Their legs be moving underneath the body slightly more than we've seen with other reptiles. It's not very sprawled, although it's not. Yeah, quite that, well, yeah, they're definitely still out a little bit. Yeah, but some of them, I mean, they're very terrestrial, that's for sure. They're not belly dragging. Most of them are not belly dragging uh, at all. Yeah, they're pretty upright uh, in terms of where their posture is. I would say some of their bones are still sort of sideways a little. I'm going to say the obvious. What? There's no way any Strophius. Can be balanced. Don't you love it? I can like I can like go back and find you guys a bunch of creationist blogs about like this animal's fake. It's just like <laughs> well, you want to see another fossil of it? <laughs> unless it's holding its neck 
Vertebrae. It has extremely long ribs on its cervical vertebrae. And so like this rib starts right here and then goes back like this far. So there's a lot of structural support in that neck. Biomechanics people have worked on these animals quite a bit. They should be able to be on land just fine. We also have trackways attributable to them that are on land. So again, I agree, it's not very nice to look at, but I think they could walk around on land with those necks. And it's, it's fantastic. So sometimes back in the day, these animals were always brief. Sometimes they're found in marine rocks. And there's another, I don't want to upset you. There's another lineage of these animals that has a neck like this that's not a close relative. Like it has the neck that's about the same length, but instead of like 10 long individual vertebrae, there's like 40 normal vertebrae, but the neck is still that long. And that one has webbed feet and absolutely lives in the water. I don't have it on here. And its neck goes like this, like it can curl its neck up, which is really gross to imagine because it's not a snake. There's still arms and legs and like a lungs probably <laughs> where they're supposed to be. So tanistrophians are really cool. Back in the day, these were always reconstructed as like sitting on a rock with their head way out over the surf, like grabbing fishes, which is so fun. I have no idea if we know that's true. Some of them have very gnarly, fishy looking, catching teeth. Um, but yeah, an interesting organism for sure. Most tanistrophids, animals in this clade right here that goes for a long time, most tanistrophids aren't as extreme as this. Several of them are like this long and there are little uh, things in ponds and stuff like that swimming around. They don't have that long of a neck, but some of the members of the clade do. And so that's the ones I always show you. So they're a diverse clade. They don't all look like this in that one rectangle over there. What other things? Uh, it seems like they're uh, experimenting with longer legs. Longer legs? Okay, yeah, interesting. And Gary was right about like being more upright. It's just they get so more upright. <laughs> I don't want to give these guys the upright cred yet. Up to now, it's been like three bulldog legs. Uh huh. Yes. And so again, you're going to see that where like in the hind limb they're a little more erect, and in the front limb they're a little more sprawly. Um, we saw that in the therapsids, right? It's so like a gorgon is like very tall in the hips, but then his arms are like this. We see that a lot in amniotes that are quadrupeds um, before you guys get to mammals. A lot of more, more, more maneuverability up front and more of a verticality in the back. That's it. We do see that. These animals are really fun. This clade. Some of them are lizardy. You can see how big some of them are. This is one from Madagascar. For a long time, all that was known was its lower jaw and part of its face. And everybody thought it was a dinosaur, a long neck sauropod. One of the dinosaurs with a long neck that eats plants because its teeth look almost identical to a long neck dinosaur plant eating teeth. It's not. It's an early archosaur. They just found one in India a few years ago that's got horns on its head. Everyone's like, whatever, that's fine <laughs> at this point. This one, look at its face. It's got like a Pinocchio face. There's no teeth in the very end of that thing. Really long. That one's from Nova Scotia, which is a fine place to be from, I think. Anybody talking about this? Here's the eyeball. The lower jaw. It's a brinkosaur, one of my favorites. That is not a tooth. They have no teeth in their premaxilla, the bone of their skull, and then that bone sticks forward, and the denaries don't touch each other. The denaries go, and then the premaxilla fits between them, and we think they have a beak on those structures, <laughs> but there's no teeth up front. It's the bones of their lower jaw and the bones of their face intersecting to make that intense beaky looking structure. They're definitely herbivores. As their evolution goes on, their skulls become like way wider than they are long, and they have huge muscles. So these are, again, a kind of herbivore that are around when early dinosaurs start becoming herbivores. So you got your cynodonts, your dicynodonts, your brinkosaurs as these herbivores, which is pretty wild. Fun. I don't know how you would characterize these things. Somewhere in this melange, somewhere in all this insane uh, body plan diversity is this clade. Pan testudines, which is turtles and all the things that are not quite turtles yet. I want to talk about turtles. Turtles are so problematic. <laughs> so I'm going to make you guys deal with it. We have a turtle fossil record that goes into the middle part of the Triassic. Obviously, turtles are still alive right now. You guys can probably think of a lot of characters that unite turtles, a lot of snake morphies that make turtles pretty different from all the other living amniotes. So I'll show you some Triassic fossils. Here's Odontochiles from China. Here's Yorinkachiles, also from China. Here's Proganochiles from Germany. And here's Hopochiles, also from Germany. 
These are four of the animals we know of that are all pretty much part of the turtle story. And what I would ask you guys to do is spend some time talking about all four of them. What's the same? What's different? What's the deal? Who's a turtle? Who's not a turtle? What's wrong with them? Anything you want. Talk about these things, Triassic turtles. So this animal, Apocheles here, certainly has individual ribs that are expanded. They are not like articulated and fused together. You're seeing these black structures poke yeah. out. That's part of its like belly rib structure that's sticking out a little bit. I don't think those are all fused up. These animals are always found disarticulated. How about this, the fossil on the far right lower? And so this then is a different animal, right? Odontochiles has, this is Odontochiles in bottom view. And if you only saw this, you'd be like, hey, that's the lower part of a turtle shell, no problem. But if you flip Odontochiles over, here's the top of it. It's got individual ribs that are expanded, but they're not all fused up. So it's got a bottom shell, but not a top shell. Okay, <laughs> what else? What about Yorinkachiles? What's going on with Yorinkachiles up at the top? That's one of the newest ones in terms of when it was found. Long tail. Nice little long tail. Also spread ribs. You guys might remember it from our anatomy lab. You're certainly gonna see it when we do our herpetology lab. Turtles shells, the top shells anyway, are literally just the vertebrae and the ribs of the turtle turned into a shell. And then they put scales on top of it. But the bony structure of a turtle shell is not new bone or something like an armadillo just makes up new bones. Turtles don't make up new bones. It's their vertebrae and their ribs which become a shell. So we all would think that animals like Proganochiles, which is a late Triassic turtle, and everyone's like, I'm not worried about it. That's a turtle. <laughs> it's got a top shell and a bottom shell. A carapace, it's called, and a plastron. It's weird that Odontochiles has a plastron and not quite the upper shell because these other animals have these really expanded ribs and their belly ribs are pretty much normal. They don't have anything like that. So you'd expect there to be maybe a top shell first. These are controversial taxa. 
All these things have teeth, by the way. Did they turtles? No teeth in the turtle's mouth. All these things have teeth. Does Another organic, really okay. I got you. Does, does organic helis have the upper temporal fenestra still? Don't remember off the top of my head. Either. I, just looked at I don't think it does. I don't think so. I think it has a turtle condition. I'm not going to call it an abscess, but um, I, mean, I don't remember, so I don't want to commit. Top Achilles does. Yes, an upper temporal fenestra and then a lower one right here that's open eventually for sure. It's so a diapsid condition. Very fun. Uh, fossils are great, right? Because you have to, you can look at a turtle and be like, I know it's a reptile, but like lizards and crocs look like each other and you're like, I get it, but turtles are so different. Fossils can show you that transition. So if we look back here, I've got three characters and I'm going to give them to you since we had a late start. Sorry about that. Three characters that unite the turtles today, the living turtles. So after Proganochiles, but Proganochiles has some of them, just like Morganucodon had some of the mammal characters I gave you. Proganochiles has some of the turtle characters I want to give you. Those turtles are a carapace, meaning an upper shell. So there's a turtle section, our turtle skeleton in cross section, so you can see it. The shell is quite literally it's, it's vertebrae, and then all these pieces of its shell are its ribs that are totally expanded laterally and then fused to each other. That is what a turtle's upper shell is made of. You can look at turtles in developmental biology, developing turtle embryos, and see them look like little lizards, and then watch them turn their backbone and their ribs into a shell as they grow up in the egg, which is so fun. So that's where turtle shells come from. You guys probably know turtles have very flexible necks because they can hide in their shell. And that's like if you could take your neck and like put it down between your lungs and pull your head in, right? They're pulling their head into their rib cage and backbone. This is really cool. So a carapace, an upper shell, is absolutely a living turtle, Sinapomorphy. The other one is the plastron, the lower part of the shell. And I think you can see in the fossils, these are evolved independently and they end up fusing together, of course, to make what you might call in total a turtle shell that you find maybe when you're on a hike. But there's a lot upper part called a carapace and a lower part called a plastron. So here's a turtle sad upside down and here's a turtle swimming so you can see its belly. That lower shell, the plastron it's called, is the exact same idea as the expanded ribs that make up the carapace. But it's these expanded, sometimes cartilaginous, sometimes bony belly ribs that almost all reptiles have today called gastralia. So there's a chameleon, chameleon's got ribs and those ribs then there's gastralia that are holding all of its guts into its little belly. Turtles turn those structures, the gastralia, into their plastron. There's a little more fun of what actually makes up a turtle shell, but for now, I'm just gonna give you guys carapace and plastron. And then the other feature that makes turtles really unique, they're one of only two living groups of vertebrates that are like this, they don't have any teeth. They've lost their marginal dentition. The maxilla, the premaxilla, and the denary that all turtles have, this one eats plants, this one absolutely eats meat. They still figure out how to do it without teeth. So a snapping turtle and a tortoise showing you that. So turtles, a shell, no surprise, and no teeth are the characters I want you guys to have for turtles. All right, I'll leave you here, but you'll see all we've done so far is this part of Archosauromorpha. And on Tuesday next week, we'll get into this towards the crown group where there's a lot of really fun stuff. And I'll save that for then. Yeah, Stuart. Um, are the turtles ancestrally swimming? Super mysterious. Pop Achilles is not Regan Achilles, we don't know. Achilles is found in the ocean and so is Eurink Achilles. 